All right, so we're going to uh, move from the uh, strategic direction talks that we've, we've had early this morning to what I like to call talks with the people that make all our dreams come true, the actual private sector folks who collect all this data for us. Um, just before I call them on the stage, it might be hard for me to see with the lights, but how many of you have uh, been part of a 3 dep project or as a contractor, subcontractor, or, or maybe even a user of the data? Not bad, not bad. That's, that's exciting. So uh, we're going to have this, uh, br this panel session with uh, our, our three panelists, but um, after that we have a couple mics set up and we'd, we'd like to do some Q&A with the audience as well. So um, I'd like to uh, now welcome to the stage Mike Schillen, Jeff Lovin, and Amarnea Gandhi. Thank you. It's hard to see. Oh, wow. <laughs> we can't see you. Okay, uh, uh, before I begin, I'd like each of you to introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Amar Nay Gandhi. Uh, I have a new company name called The Company Name, if you saw my original <laughs> the slide over there. But I work with Dewberry Engineers. Um, we have been supporting USGS since 1998 and really been uh, a prime contractor as well as a partner uh, with USGS and heavily involved with the 3D elevation program um, among other programs as well. Good morning everyone. My name is Mike Schill and I'm a <coughs> senior account manager for NV5 Geospatial. Some of you may uh, know us as Quantum Spatial. I went through a, a transition uh, last year. Uh, glad to be with you. I'm the program manager for um, NV5's uh, Gypsy contract and, and 3DEP. Uh, program and like Dewberry, we've been working with USGS since the mid 90s. And I'm uh, Jeff Lovin, Senior Vice President of Wolpert, and uh, Wolpert has been working for USGS since 1992 as a prime contractor. So through several programs leading up to 3DEP. So great, thank you. Um, I, I wrote some questions down here. I'm going to ask uh, ask you gentlemen uh, one at a time, but uh, feel free to chime in if. Uh, if you'd like. I'm going to start with you, Amar, here. Um, if you could kick us off, can you please share your thoughts on how 3DEP has impacted your approach to workforce management, uh, resource planning over the last seven years, and then um, what changes are you anticipating the program will need in order to continue to evolve and, and other national programs also ramp up? So as Kevin showed and so did Jason, and um, in terms of the, the ramp up of the 3D elevation program over the years. I think it was the last five or to seven years where it's really ramped up. So we in the private sector had to ramp up ourselves as well, both from an operational perspective as well as a management perspective as well. From an operations perspective, we had our, uh, our acquisition team. The, we, uh, we, used to, we do still subcontract a lot of our, lot of our data acquisition. So we did have a much larger pool of subcontractors, many of them in the room uh, today as well, that provide this data acquisition. There were many more sensors bought to, to support this, um, the, the amount of data that needed to be acquired. Um, we also had to internally for data production, you know, put more steps in place. We had to um, make sure that we had a better, more, more of a production-based structure um, it was different doing small projects, but when you start doing big projects like the state of Florida and mapping large areas of the state of Louisiana um, and other such, not only did we have to operationalize internally, but also work a lot with partners as well. We, uh, three of us have worked on several projects together as well, uh, where it made sense for us to work together on, on specific projects as well. And we did see ourselves from an operational perspective uh, have to had to make some changes during and how we did our uh, production as well. Uh, for example, we used to have um, an operational person in charge of the entire project, the life cycle of the project. We needed to then change it so that we have different stages of production. We had folks that had classification, LIDAR classification experts and leaders in, in that product line. Uh, the brake lines, which is also a big component of what we, um, what we do for, as part of the 3D elevation program. We had product line leads there as well. We noticed that that allowed us so that we could scale up 
and scale down as needed as well. Past seven years, we've just been scaling up, and that meant that we had a lot of new staff in our team. And when we have the new staff, we have to train them. And so we, we really invested a lot in the different training procedures that we needed uh, to do and, and create these SOPs and qual uh, checklists and, and have an independent quality review team as well. So it took a fair amount of um, effort to ra ramp up as such. We do understand that from, from an operational perspective that there are changes as well in terms of what's coming next. So for example, there's a big focus now on the 3D hydrography program. Um, it actually had its benefits to us on the 3D program as well, because with the 3D hydrography program, and essentially that's defining those blue lines, and, and as such, you have to look at it from a perspective of, you need to um, do a much better job in terms of brake lining um, as one of the components. And we used to do a lot of brake lining for water bodies as part of the 3D, but the 3D HP takes it to a whole nother level. And as a result, we, we had to build new machine learning tools to be able to do that. And when we did that, we realized that the, it, it actually has its benefits to the brake lining process we are doing for the 3D elevation program as well. So it allowed us to um, you know, look at both of them and, and look at both these programs and see how we can ramp up or down depending on the type of work uh, that we do. Um, one other comment I wanted to make was from a management perspective. They, we, working with USGS and working for so many years, we actually added folks in our management team so that, and have that direct communication with uh, USGS as well. So we had different project managers for these different large projects, and they would work directly with the USGS task managers as well. Mike? Yeah, I, I, I think Amar's spot on. Um, the, the two other things I think uh, that we experienced uh, was, you know, it was important for us to build a workforce that was very agile and nimble and had the ability uh, to, to, you know, take on different roles uh, and different uh, uh, tasks within the, the overall workflow process. Uh, so we weren't training people just to do one thing uh, because, you know, we needed to have that flexibility to, to move people around to accommodate uh, project schedules and surge uh, when, when the, the time came uh, for, for having to do that. Um, the other thing too, um, we own planes and sensors. So when I look back at when we first started with uh, 3DEP, we were flying you know, single engine 206s low and slow with uh, 40 or 50 megahertz LiDAR sensors. Um, that's obviously all changed dramatically, uh, and I think really 3DEP has been the principal driving force for uh, modernization of our fleet to turbine aircraft and uh, much uh, more advanced LiDAR sensors that, of course, you're all, all seeing here this week. So uh, that's, that's a, um, a substantial, uh, it was a substantial investment for all of us to, to do that. And, um, and again, it, I think it's uh, another aspect of the whole transition. Jeff? Yeah, these guys have pretty well covered it. It's very similar. Again, uh, a huge ramp up uh, for us all. Uh, same with us. We've added LiDAR sensors over this time. Uh, I think we're on our third generation of LiDAR sensors since we started 3DEP of improvements. Um, added aircraft. And again, created these specialized teams. However, they do have to adapt. And, and as we saw the unfortunate funding downturn the last year or two, it actually has given us benefit, though, to get ready for that next big program, 3DHP. So we've done a lot of, we fortunate to work on one of those pilot projects. And with that, again, adapting, training that team, getting ready for some of these hydro pro uh, uh, projects. And again, incorporating, I think we'll hear more and more, you heard in Kevin's speech and, and uh, with Jason, more and more automation, machine learning and stuff. So it, it, it has been neat to look back at how this program has driven forward uh, not only LiDAR technology, our firms, many of the firms in the room, and, and what's been developed because of it. Thanks, guys. Um, I may regret asking you all this question because this is really kind of a question directed back at me on the stage. Uh, it has to do with our specification and the maturity of it. Um, can you all share some feedback on how, how you all have adapted to the evolution of the 3 depth LiDAR-based specification? Uh, what, you know, we've been, we've been uh, updating and changing the spec since uh, it, it was originally written. Um, what are some of the positive outcomes of, of updating that spec and the challenges and, and maybe some suggestions for us to stop doing or 
change to make it different? Sure. No, I'll, I'll make some brief comments. So, um, you know, it's been a it's been a work in progress, right? Um, you know, 3DEP has evolved over time, and as a result, the specifications have evolved. And I think the the really good thing is that we've, as your partners, worked with you to 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 uh, in that evolution, right? You you know the there was always an effort to seek input and feedback from the, uh, you know, all, all different the stakeholders, including the, the contractors, to incorporate that and work with you uh, to get to a standard today that I think is you know, obviously very different than the one that started in 2009. I think it was uh, LBS V1.3, if I'm not mistaken. Um, still have nightmares about that one. Um, and, uh, uh, and then I think the other comment is that, you know, as the, the specifications have evolved, I think USGS has done a much better job of communicating uh, those, those changes or, and, and seeking input. Uh, your uh, LIDAR-based specification standards and specifications website now uh, has, is a great, tremendous resource uh, for all of us to go to and, and download the, the latest commentary and, and uh, updates uh, on the specifications. So, it's, um, you know, got, got, looking forward to more evolution. Um, so, and, you know, we have seen, as Mike said, you know, changes, right? And there have been changes. And the way, way we've mostly seen it is that it's always been that you, you, the, the intent of, this, uh, of what we are trying to derive in terms of derived products has pretty much remained the same. It's, it's the letter of the specification, if you want to call it that, that could have changed. A great example is um, when, when we assess accuracy of the data over the years, there has been a much bigger focus on, on you know, providing statistical methods for inter-swath accuracy and intra-swath accuracy. It, it was something we were doing anyway. It was something that we needed to do, and all of us uh, did as well, is to make sure that the data were good enough for us to be, you know, take it to that next stage in our production process. But now it's a requirement in the spec to provide that as additional information. So those things have been fairly um, straightforward and easy because, again, we, the intent of the, even the original specification is, is still the same. And so that has helped quite a bit as well. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. Jeff, I'm gonna have you kick us off on this one. Uh, so as you know, we saw in, um, well, all three of our, our uh, talks today, you know, 3 Depths national coverage is now uh, exceeding 84%, and we're starting to uh, investigate a um, multimodal approach to, to getting data that can meet these, these um, newly uh, updated requirements. Um, I was wondering how, uh, what role do you guys see as the private sector uh, playing in the development of these new technologies as they relate to this multimodal approach we're looking at? Um, yeah, I, I think as I look back over the program, it's been so interesting to see the application of this data and what has developed from it, from detecting vernal pools in Maine to uh, abandoned gas wells, orphan wells in Ohio, to invasive species mapping out west, to now forest fire mitigation work in California. And you know, again, using this 3 depth data as a remote sensing tool and the advent of machine learning and, and everything in the process for extracting these features, it is really is what brought some of these partners to the table, right? And uh, helped justify their cost share. So when you look at, as we move forward with the integrating the other technologies and the update cycle as well, what will drive that, I think, um, will, will be, uh, again, those, those needs are still there, those challenges will still be there, and that will bring those partners back to the table. Um, and Brian had a perfect slide with the graph talking about the growth in QL1, right, the desire and need for it. As our processing has got more efficient, sensors have got more uh, efficient as well, we're able to bring the cost down, and now QL1 is much more affordable. We just saw completed Florida, QL1, Ohio, Minnesota's doing QL1, more and more of that data. So you've got these states that were done back in 2016, 2017, whether it be some business driver of some problem they're trying to solve with this data, it's just that desire of, hey, we want, we want the most accurate data we can get, which again, better data drives you know, better models for algorithms and so forth. So I think when you look at that, that's what's really gonna pull and keep the update cycle going and drive and bring in um, keep, keep, 
keep the maintenance and update the program going. Yeah, I just also think that as, as uh, the um, stakeholders uh, demand uh, more from uh, the data uh, that we're creating, higher QL levels, uh, better uh, accuracies, and so forth. It's also bringing um, the manufacturers, uh, they're a partner in this as well, uh, to the table uh, to, to, to really invest in the R&D uh, and, in, and, and the development, the production of new sensor technology, uh, new platform technology, um, you know, whether it's uh, Zeppelins or uh, UAS systems or uh, mobile mapping. I think as we move into next gen uh, 3DEP, uh, it's really going to be a catalyst, I think, and, and hopefully an explosion, similar to what we saw, I think, with, with 3 depth baseline, but uh, I really do think that they're going to, the demand is going to, to uh, is, if it's there, they're going to answer the call. And, you know, as the producers uh, and uh, developers of, of the data that's coming out of those sensor platforms, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be uh, in a position, I think, to support the future requirements. Yeah, and I'll also add that the, the, the effort's been done as part of the 3D Nation study and uh, what's coming out of that. You know, we've been actively involved with both NOAA and USGS related to the 3D Nation study. And what is, what, the, the really nice thing about that is, is it being, you know, sensor agnostic in terms of, or technology agnostic, I should say, uh, but also the fact that it's now incorporating things beyond just elevation over land, or in some cases, people will say bare earth over land because that was the big focus of the 3DEP, even though we got a lot of extra other data that went uh, that you get out of these LIDAR systems. Uh, so it really brings in now these other aspects of what is needed to create this, um, this essentially topography map, whether it's submerged or over land. And, and as, as part of that, in terms of what changes do we see, we have a baseline for, for three depth. So now let's see where it's where there's changes, and that's likely going to be where we are going to want to map as well. And I, I see that being the focus, if, if, and we are you know preparing from that for the, that from the private sector space as well um, to make sure that we can you know accommodate those those kinds of needs. Thanks, um, Jeff. I'm going to throw this one to you. One you know one of the criticisms that we get. Is, uh, is turnaround times for the data. Um, you know, we, we show these, these maps that are green um, and people have an impression that the data is going to be available the next day, the contract is let. Um, so what roles do you think the private sector can play in accelerating that part of data development and delivery to the partners? And um, what are some of your obstacles in, in getting faster turnaround times to get the data in, in the user's hands more quickly? Sure. Well, um, you know, the, the, the data showed it in the presentation, right? We're talking 250,000 250, square miles of LiDAR data coming into a QC shop at USGS. That's, that's quite a formidable uh, amount of data to uh, uh, QC, and it's a very robust and rigorous QC process. So I understand, right, we live it, we see both sides of it. Because as we bring these state partners to the table in these projects, often they're on annual budget cycles. And they have typically a driving need of why they want this data. And uh, so they're anxious to, to get their hands on it. And uh, one thing I think we could all do better, um, we've talked about it just this week, is educating ahead of time, making sure these clients understand that when you, you sign up for this, you know, it, it will be 18 months likely before you get this data, but here is why, and really educate them on this rigorous and thorough QC process and explain that, look, you're getting this, you know, USGS certified stamp of approval on this data. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to spend that money that you would have possibly or, or ramp up your own staff to do that. But it is a challenge because of those budget cycles at the state partner level and so forth. So, you know, education is one way, I think, to, to try to help partners understand this ahead of time uh, so they maybe can plan budget better from the schedule. But talk about a radical idea, a paradigm shift would possibly be, you know, peer QC, right? One of the gypsy primes, right? Obviously, don't, not QC in our own data, but QC in each other's projects. And that would also give some of that surge capability, right, uh, to adapt uh, to that need as, as they're, you know, if we have a great Great year of funding and a lot of data coming in, big projects, a lot of QL1. You know, you could have Gypsy Primes QCing other Primes data. Okay. 
I, I also think as as we have matured in terms of our production workflow processes, delivery processes, um, that as we move forward, uh, hopefully we can all leverage the cloud, right? Um, so working together in the cloud, doing both workflow and validation, I think has an, there's an opportunity there uh, to, to speed up the process. Uh, so I think we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, and I think the other thing that I, I know that GS is, is considering and has been doing on kind of a case-by-case -case basis is, you know, allowing some provisional data to be delivered. But I think you're, uh, you're doing the right thing in terms of, you know, putting some more, more formality on it and, and, and uh, kind of qualifications or clarifications on exactly how and, and what they're getting, what the end users are getting. But um, that may help alleviate some of the pressure as well. Great. Amar? Yeah, I'll just add to that provisional data <clears throat> as well, because I do believe that there, will, there are certain agencies who will not want to wait, uh, would not want to get provisional data. They will want to wait for the final data product. Like we do a lot of work with FEMA for the flood studies, and they are, uh, until USGS certifies the data that it is complete and it is fully accurate, we will not start our flood studies with it. But there are others that do. They, they need the data for a specific small application. I know USGS has made some, um, in terms of what they have asked us as uh, contractors to provide with our uh, deliveries, we, we provide block del deliveries, and that does inc include accuracy information for each of those blocks as well. So that is information that can be shared to some extent. Um, they, we have to wait till the final delivery is over to make sure that the accuracy assessments are completely done. But there are some areas that are some needs, especially during disasters and things like that, that they need that data. And again, the way it has been structured or it is being structured is that there is that ability to provide that provisional data to, uh, uh, to the stakeholders. Jeff, you have something? Yeah, and, and you know, another thought on this um, related to that is, again, as we develop more and more derivative products um, for folks, right, that, that is really the need to solve some issue or problem. You know, possibly that is a, a solution is that we can, again, utilizing the cloud, streamlining processes, that we can produce some of these derivative products and actually get that in their hands to solve, whether it's emergency response or what have you, more quickly while the data goes through um, the full QC possible as well. Okay, next question for y'all um, has to do with uh, partnership inclusivity. Uh, as we saw in Kevin's video, and, and we've said it several times, you know, the private sector has really helped contribute to the success of this program through education, collaboration with, with uh, multiple groups, and um, engagement. Uh, do you see opportunities like that moving forward with this uh, next generation that we're, we're looking at? And, and if so, uh, what kinds of stakeholder groups have we not um, approached or engaged with that, that we could really see benefit from? And Mike, I'll start with you on that one. Sure, Th thanks Jason. Uh, yeah, I guess two-part two, two, two part response. F first is we've still got 16% of the country to do, right? So we're not done um, and we gotta all work together to go find those partnerships and, and uh, get them involved in the program. Uh, you know, the big challenge of course is we've, we've uh, Kevin and yourself noted is the, is the West. Um, but uh, obviously with, with some deference to the upper Midwest as well. Uh, and so I think as we've moved west, we've seen uh, a shift in uh, a potential uh, funding partners just based on the nature of the geography and the demand or the need. Uh, so I think, <clears throat> you know, partners uh, like BOR, uh, BLM, uh, Department of Energy, um, even uh, DOD activities that, that where there are federal lands, whether civilian or military, um, who haven't, have participated to some degree, but, but haven't really uh, done so at, the, say, the level of FEMA and NRCS, I think there's an opportunity for all of us to continue to try to educate those agencies and, and encourage them to participate um, in, in that. And I also think that the, is, you know, the issues that the West faces, wildfires, uh, for example, um, are really also driving, uh, and, and resiliency, are also driving, I think, the opportunity, um, unfortunately, uh, to, to really bring new partners to the table, whether they're universities or NGOs. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think we're, we're going to continue to see more of that in the West as, as, we, as we try to button up the final 16%. In terms of next-gen uh, 3DEP, I really, 
not uh, characterize it as the Wild West, but it's going to be different, right? Um, it's going to be an, a very agile program, uh, probably not a, 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 you know, a rigid standard per se. Um, it'll be, um, you know, unlike the baseline where it's uh, seamless and um, consistent, you're going to have an approach that identifies where change occurs, where you need to update it, what methodology and technology are you going to use. So I think the, the, the cast of, of potential partners there um, grows, actually, because I think, you know, w with the collection of higher density data, higher accuracy data, um, you could see, uh, I could easily see folks like big tech, um, you know, uh, uh, others that, uh, uh, utility companies, large urban um, areas, uh, urban centers, um, and uh, other uh, folks that, again, haven't really been primary uh, investors in, in the program coming on board because they're now going to be able to get uh, some, you know, some data that, that will uh, more address their needs. So I, I would look for maybe some private partner, public partnerships, et cetera, uh, in the future. Mark? Yeah, and just thinking of how the program itself is evolving with, with what's intended to come out of the 3D Nation study with um, getting the 3D HP um, and you know the kind of needs for that and potentially the stakeholders related to water resources groups within various different uh, states. Also the, the, the inland bathymetry and that whole, uh, that, that sort of that plan moving forward will enable a whole other set of stakeholders to, uh, to come and join in uh, together. NOAA and USGS are already working so closely uh, with each other and so are many of these other federal agencies, but it's really getting the state agencies to get, get involved as well. Um, I understand the same similar kind of BAA process is going to be used for that. And I think again it opens up the door for, um, for you know, a lot of these potential uh, stakeholders to be part of this program. And you know, the private sector plays a big role here as well because we work a lot with these different agencies. And it, we, we take it on ourselves to explain to the agencies that, you, you, uh, as we did with the 3D elevation program, is that it, it makes so much more sense to, first of all, get um, you know, consistent quality uh, methods uh, to, to in how we are doing this, consistent uh, approaches to how the data are being collected um, and, and then what kind of products are being derived. And we, we fully expect to see that through the BAA process as well. And you know, hopefully, there'll be a lot more engagement from the stakeholders as well. Jeff? Uh, to key on your comment of you know, what partners aren't here that should be, right? I think um, one that I've, I've been trying for a while, but I think the FAA <clears throat> should be a big, big player and have a, have a, a lot to gain from, from getting more involved as a, as a partner with the program. Um, EPA, right? Um, again, looking at 3DHP. But as Mike said, it, it is going to be interesting looking at the next gen of the program, I think it will look and feel a little more like the early days of 3DEP, right? Because the projects are going to, at first, I think, be scattered because it'll be either by that demand or hunger for the updated data or higher resolution with QL1, or it'll be project partner driven. But I think just as we've saw it kind of normalize through here, I think so many years into this next wave of things, we'll see that. Although, right, we will be working on minerals, 3DHP, and uh, topo updates um, as we go. So, again, you know what Mike said, um, I think that does open it wide open for a, a litany of new partners to come to the table. To yeah, and, and the only thing I would add, again, talking about 3DHP, I mean, obviously the NHD WBD community is a very mature community. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, and work with the, that community. I think they're absolutely integral in the success of, of uh, 3DHP moving forward. Uh, you know, they're going to need to be a part of that partnership involved in that development process. Uh, so uh, I think we also need to, 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 to make sure that that community is fully on board and supportive. Uh, and then the last thing I'd say um, is that, you know, we all um, uh, enjoy and, and, and uh, respect the professional organizations that we're involved with, whether it's ASPRS or NISJIC, MAPS, um, you know, we're, uh, I think those associations have a role to play as well, right, for advocacy at, at, in Washington, for example, uh, and with, within their own membership. So I think, you know, that, that's, an, again, with 3DEP, you saw an explosion of interest and, and, and uh, program 
dedicated to 3DEP over the last six or seven years at all of the conferences, just like this one. Um, and again, I think that's something that we're going to continue to see, and we need. All right, that's, um, sorry. That's all the questions I had. Um, we've got a couple minutes that we left uh, for open Q&A, but before we, uh, before we do that, I just wanted to thank you guys for the panel. It was very insightful, I really appreciate it, and, and if we could give it, our panelists uh, a quick round of applause. Okay, so we've got um, just a few minutes left in our, our session. Uh, we have some microphones set up if anybody has any questions they would like to ask our panelists. I see a shadowed hand out there. It's a, you might have to come up to the microphone. I assume that's where the mic is for you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Can I go ahead? Can a partner of yours use international partnerships, subcontractors, when working with 3DEP? So I think I heard the question, can we use international uh, sub uh, partners? Um, for any, um, any kind of work that we do related to um, working especially for this particular program, based on the need of and, and the requirements, uh, we, we have to get permission from the agency or the, the contract, the geospatial products and services contract, to add a subcontractor. So what we do is we put in a, um, a justification and a request, and uh, we provide all that information, and it's, it's up to the uh, USGS to, um, to, to, off, to make that decision. I, I can say that we've had um, uh, subcontractors from, from in international locations, especially from Canada and north of us, um, and, um, and they have been approved in the past. Excellent. Thank you. There's a question. Yeah. yeah thank, thank you uh, for the panel. It was very, for moderating as well as for the speaker. So it was very interesting. Uh, kind of the themes I heard going through this is being, is uh, having to adapt and modernize. Uh, I just would, would like to kind of hear your experiences. From a top down perspective, how did you guys do change management? And from a bottom up, how did you do change management? And I'm interested on the USGS side as well as the contractors, the gypsy contractors. Would you mind repeating? It was uh, yeah, I'm just sorry. a little closer. And maybe, maybe take your mask off. Yeah, that might time. be better. So I appreciated the panel discussion. I heard uh, kind of the themes going through this is adapting uh, and modernizing your organizations to be more efficient as, you're, you, know, as you went through the 3DEP program. Can you maybe speak to your experiences on, as you did change management in your organizations as you were trying to be more efficient? Maybe your top-down approach and maybe your bottom-up. And I'm interested in both the USGS as well as the gypsy contractors. Yeah, so, you know, again, been involved my, almost my whole career with, with USGS in some way. I was project manager of our contract way back years ago. And, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a... Uh, it's been a big driver, right? And I mean, that's the beauty of the program being fund, funded to a level that allows us to invest, right? So uh, Mike said it, it, it's a huge investment. I remember even back before 3DEP, we were doing imagery, DOQs, right? Um, image scanning technology, right? It's still the early days of orthos and refining that process and building our infrastructure to do that and so forth. And then along comes 3DEP and it's, as the funding grew, we added sensors, added aircraft and so forth. So it, it is a, uh, it is quite a challenge as a you know as a manager to uh, uh, walk that fine line of you know we're anticipating the funding will be there and we're going to add the staff and grow the capability and so forth with it. But again, that's where I've always said this program is a model. It's it's I, I've always said it's a win 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 when I you know advocate or I'm talking to somebody about it. It's because um, the communication has been so. Uh, open and good between USGS and, and us co and the contractors, the primes, um, to understand what's coming next and where it's going. And that, that's, been, that's been the key of, okay, how do you manage this internally, is, is knowing the next couple of years, here's the forecast, here's where we're going, and being asked to be involved in helping advocate. So we know, we know what we're hearing from, you know, from a budget standpoint, hopefully, that where things are going. But it, 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 it's, uh, in the end of the day, it's a big risk, right? <laughs> Um, as a business owner to, to make those kind of investments and so forth. But it's, 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 it's been 
it's, it's, it's uh, obviously been a great program for, you saw the number of hands in the room, right? Almost everyone in here is involved in some way, so. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been interesting to, to, to manage that with, as a business owner. On, a, on the USGS side, um, you know, speaking at the program level, what we tend to do is see um, how, how things are happening and then uh, every year we set goals and challenges to the operations center who, who do that. So one of the examples is, um, and, and I, don't, we, I don't think we had a, a chart up there, but if, if you've seen this exponential increase of data that's been coming in, our data management budget has been flat since 2015. Yeah. So we, we're, we've constantly been asked to do more with the same. Um, so I'm just glad it's not less, but it's, it's been the same. Um, so, you know, we, we challenge our operations staff to, to figure out how do we improve turnaround times with the constraints we have. And, and one thing that we've done that I think has been fairly effective is instead of waiting for an entire project to be completed before we disseminate it, we started um, uh, disseminating projects at the work unit level. And so you don't get the entire project of, of the area, but you get the, the work units as they get reviewed and validated and uh, through our production. And so um, I'm, I'm really proud of our operations center coming up with creative ways to, to um, try to increase that throughput without having uh, extra funds available to do it. I'm, oh, I, I was just gonna add, uh, COVID has really thrown a curveball to all of us, right? So we've had to really be agile uh, and flexible in terms of our, um, uh, our remote workforce and, and making sure they have the tools and the, uh, and the, and the pipe uh, to handle uh, the, the kind of data that we have to handle. So uh, I know that's been a real challenge. I think all of us have done um, collectively a, a good job at it. It's not quite the same. Um, Looking retroactively, looking back, we, you know, I think we thought, oh, yeah, we can make, we can do this, and we have. But I think there is an element um, that you lose when you're not together like this, right? I think, and, and the conference today really, uh, this conference again, first one that I've been to, uh, where there's actually people, um, exemplifies that. Think about the networking, the collaboration, uh, the exchange that you're you're having this week versus you know maybe what you could have done um, remotely. So, yeah. thanks. Um, we've got one more question over here, um, and then be mindful of everybody's time. We'll call it after that. Good morning, Jason, and uh, folks up there. This is Sean Vaughn. I'm with Minnesota. And we've been recognized uh, here this week for our efforts for bringing quality level one lighter uh, across the state. I've got a question I've been struggling with the past couple of days. I was in the uh, uh, workshop with Amar and, uh, on bathymetric data, topobathing. And so as we look forward to complete the state of Minnesota uh, for quality level one, and we sit here and get very excited, at least I do, about 3D HP, I'm struggling with if we're gonna miss an opportunity in Minnesota to not collect the remainder areas of our state with a vision for inland bathymetric collection. So here's my question, is that in its infancy, but it is starting to mature, can we and should we be considering uh, the inclusion of inland bathymetric data as we wrap up our state? And I ask this question because we've worked really hard to bring all of these partners together to uh, have a collection as large as we have in the state of Minnesota. And as soon as we're done, it is gonna be very difficult for us to go to upper level managers across all agencies and beyond to say, this is, we're so excited what we have now, but guess what we, now we want? We want to fold into 3D Nation and 3D HP, and I'm here to ask for money again, and I'm really afraid we're not going to get it. So I'm reaching out to seek advice as if we should be planning with three vendors up there and a leader in USG to be considering this as a, as a time to move forward already for a state like Minnesota. Yeah, I know, and uh, having 10,000 lakes makes uh, Inland Bathy <laughs> quite important for you guys. Um, you know, it, it's, tough, it's tough to say one way or another, right? We, we don't have a specification for Inland Bathy yet. I mean, that's something that we've been working on, where we've been working with, um, you know, NOAA and the Army Corps who have a coastal Bathy specification, and, and we're trying to a, a, adapt and adopt parts of that. 
Um, so without a specification, we could collect data, but it, there's nothing to test it to. Um, right now, we've been focusing on pilots to learn the lessons, to understand where it makes sense to use topobathy LIDAR, where do, are we going to need to do acoustic sonar to fill in the holes, what times of year, turbidity, um, all of seasonality, all of those things, we don't have enough answers to confidently go ahead and, and do that. But, um, you know, we can use, we can definitely use help on that, on that component, you know, to expedite getting that specification out there so we can more confidently collect data that we know um, we can grade and test and, and you know, quote unquote, certify that, that it's going to meet the requirements we wanted. I don't know if anybody else has. Yeah, no. First of all, thank you for attending the workshop, four hour workshop on Sunday morning, 8 a.m. I really appreciated you being there for, for that as well. But, you know, going back to sort of that progression in terms of what we are seeing with, with how the 3D Nation uh, study or the data that are being set, being done for creating a 3D Nation elevation product as such, you know, it's moved from the 3D elevation program, which was topography over land, to, not, to this 3D HP, which isn't essentially giving you more topography data. It is essentially defining those blue lines, if you want to call it that, and doing it at a scale, resolution, and, um, and ability to use it in a variety of different applications. Um, the, the 3D HP program is sort of that stepping stone, I think, in some ways, to, the, to that next stage of the inland um, uh, bathymetry program, especially for, for USGS, and being technology agnostic as such, you know, it's not going to be Topo Bathilara that does the entire thing. There'll be other aspects of technology as well. Um, I, I think that progression also allows from a funding mechanism, and you brought up a valid point, do I have to go back and, and, and ask for more money? But I think the intent and what these studies show, uh, the 3D Nation study, is that these are going to be additional benefits. So you're not, the reason or your justification for asking for uh, requesting more funds is because you're going to see these additional benefits uh, with these data. So I, I hope that backs it up in terms of, and that's why it's a continuing cycle as such, right? You, you, we, are, we are doing step by step, improving the quality of the data overall, uh, you know, for example, in the state of Minnesota as well. Oh, yeah, and I was just gonna say, I, I think um, with, with USGS now characterizing really this, this two-legged stool, if you will, as 3D NTM. Um, hopefully that gives you um, a construct uh, to be able to go uh, to your, um, your, your bosses and, and make a case for um, it's not one and done, it's a continuum, it's a program, and, and you can wrap 3D NTM around that. Yeah, I mean, it is tough timing, Sean, and I, and I know I've, I'm working with a few other states. You and I talked about that they're looking at doing this as well, and being so early, those questions do get asked. It's like, why well, I thought we just mapped. <laughs> now we, right. you know, but what we've done there is from an education process, talking about how critical the QL1 data is as that base framework, and then the enhancement comes later. Almost one has to come for the, before the other. Could it be done simultaneously? Sure. But we've, that's kind of how we've, we've approached it with some of these other states that just wrapped up a big LIDAR program and now are looking at 3DHP that it, it is that enhancement. There are added benefits that you get from it. And in the case of uh, a couple of the states that we're talking to that have huge interest in 3DHP out of the gate is it is bringing those different funding partners to the table. So you might not have to go back to the same, the same guys twice. Um, um, but uh, yeah, it, it's... I understand your challenge for sure. Thank you. All right, and with that, I, I think we could probably chat for hours more, but being mindful that we're over, I didn't want to stop the discussion while it, it was going so well. But thank you all for, for coming, and uh, once more, can we get a, a round of applause for our panelists? All right, and with that, we'll conclude. Thank you. <laughs>